Hello and welcome. You're listening to the American Interest Podcast with me, Richard Aldous. For this week's episode, our assistant editor, Aaron Sabarian, sat down with New America co-founder Michael Lind to talk about his book, The New Class War, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. Take a listen. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. So, uh, to start, uh, what is the new class war? Well, I argue it's the uh, conflict that has broken out between the college-credentialed, uh, university-educated, managerial and professional mm-hmm. class, which dominates Western democracies on both sides of the Atlantic, and the uh, high school-educated mm-hmm. working class of all races and uh, national origins, which is about two-thirds of the population. In the middle of the 20th century, uh, I argue there was a kind of class peace treaty or what political scientists call a settlement Mm -hmm. uh, between capitalists, managers, the working class uh, for a couple of decades uh, following 1945. That broke down in the late 20th century, largely as a result of the atrophy of uh, the institutions that had amplified the power of less educated working class people, the most important of which were trade unions, Mm. uh, churches and other religious organizations, and local political mass membership parties, uh, uh, political machines at the local level. Mm. And as a result of that, uh, there's just been a shift of uh, power and influence in all three realms of the economy and the culture and government. Uh, And I argue the frustration this has uh, created uh, on, on behalf of much of the population, has uh, ultimately led to a lot of these rebellions mm-hmm. we see associated with the election of Trump, with the Brexit vote in Europe, and with the uh, Yellow Vest revolts in France. Mm-hmm. So part of the story is that there's been a rise of a managerial elite, as you call it, um, and that this managerial elite is different in character from some of the elites and say like the 19th century. Could you elaborate a bit on what are sort of the distinct features of this managerial class? Yeah, I don't claim any particular originality. I follow uh, James Burnham uh, Mm -hmm. and one time an influential American Trotskyist who became uh, one of the founders of post-war American conservatism Mm -hmm. in his book, The Managerial Revolution, written during World War II. Mm -hmm. He argued that The Marxists uh, were wrong. Uh, The two major classes in the Western world at that time, in the 1940s, were not uh, workers and capitalists, but uh, workers and managers, because at that point, thanks to the rise of large corporations, there was what uh, Burley and Means, in their classic study of the corporation, described as separation of ownership and control. And you had this bureaucratic corporate executive class who were not necessarily the biggest shareholders. Mm -hmm. Uh, And particularly nowadays when share ownership is widely dispersed and fluctuating, uh, it's kind of a legal fiction Mm -hmm. to say that the uh, shareholders are the owners of the corporation and the managers are merely their passive uh, agents. Uh, So so that was the argument. Uh, Burnham uh, argued, and I follow him, that the managerial elite includes far more than corporate executives, mm-hmm. includes professionals, uh, experts of all kinds, uh, civil servants, uh, and also the military, which he argued would become increasingly influential in societies. Uh, so uh, at the same time, you see the working class has metamorphosed from, it was never majority industrial workers, mm-hmm. uh, it was about a third at the most, with the rest being service workers, clerical mm-hmm. workers. Uh, <clears throat> but at the present, as a result of uh, automation and, mm-hmm. and productivity growth, uh, most of the growth of new working class jobs is in uh, hospitality and leisure, <clears throat> in healthcare, mm-hmm. and in uh, retail. Uh, and those tend to be very poorly paid, very non union jobs. Mm-hmm. So the migration of employment from the uh, unionized manufacturing sector to these sectors has contributed to inequality. There's a common libertarian argument that basically goes, well, if you look at the data, working class living standards defined by some abstract metric have improved. Everything's more or less fine. To the extent there's a crisis, it's more one of perception than fact. There's no real problem here. How do you respond to those kinds of, uh, I guess you could say they're sort of progressive, optimistic arguments? Well, it's true that as as a result of technological progress, Mm 
uh, poor people have access to all kinds of technology mm -hmm. that rich people did not half a century ago. Uh, the problem with libertarians is they're like Marxists uh, they, and, and like some progressives. Mm -hmm. They think money is everything, mm -hmm. right? They ignore power. They ignore dignity. Uh, so the, the basic premise is, well, you've lost your unions, which amplified your influence mm -hmm. if, if you were at a high school diploma. But in return, you make $500 more a year. So it's a wash. Right. Uh, and and it's for, for the American tradition, particularly, I find it very odd because mm -hmm. the whole basis of American republicanism, small r republicanism, mm -hmm. is the idea that, that ordinary people should have power and there should be right. checks and balances. It, the idea is not that you can have a dictatorship or an autocracy or an aristocracy as long as they pay compensation to everyone right. else. Right, right. And on that, so here at the magazine, we're very interested in reviving what we call the political center. Um, in the book, you have this very in interesting observation that the center, quote unquote, of elite opinion is very different than the center of working class opinion. Even as your emphasis on class compromise sounds I suppose, kind of centrist. Do you identify as a centrist? And what do you think are the biggest mistakes, if any, that sort of self-styled centrists have made? Well, Marx said, I'm not a Marxist. So mm -hmm. I like saying, I'm Michael Lind, I'm not a Lindist. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm less interested in, in staking out a position on the political spectrum, either the elite spectrum or the working mm -hmm. class spectrum, which I argue are two different political spectrums than I am in, in nation building. And, and how do you rebuild a functioning democratic nation state in which politics is not all about 51% trying mm -hmm. to annihilate 49%? Uh, and I think we have to uh, be as inclusive as possible. In the book, I, I call this democratic pluralism. Yes. Uh, and, and I say that essentially that's the idea. Be, you have to have a government based on compromise. Mm -hmm. Before you can have compromise, you have to admit conflict. And also before you have compromise, you have to admit that the conflicts are legitimate. Mm -hmm. Because if one side is simply wrong, or the one side is simply evil, then there's no point to compromise. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a very realistic view of politics, arguably, that is employers and employees have clashing interests mm -hmm. on things like trade and immigration. There is no one mm -hmm. objective policy. Uh, so you have to negotiate. You have to make trade-offs. Uh, different religious groups and secular people have equally legitimate uh, differences of value. Uh, they have to coexist in the same society. Uh, and uh, when it comes to matters of class, uh, uh, the vast majority of uh, working class people simply are going to be outweighed in politics and in the media by the minority of, of uh, very well educated and very well financed people. Mm -hmm. So they have to have their own organizations to exercise what John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, the economist, called countervailing power. Mm -hmm. But, but my vision is one of com compromise and negotiation. It's not mm -hmm. uh, that a group of experts gets together and decides mm -hmm. what the ideal policy is, and then the government just imposes this. I don't know in advance mm -hmm. what the ideal policy is for uh, Uber and Lyft drivers. Mm -hmm. I think that the drivers should have some kind of uh, collective representation and should be able to negotiate with the employers. But if they can come up with a solution that's acceptable mm -hmm. to both, that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. So you also in the book talk about, uh, on, on in this democratic pluralist vision, you say the state serves as a kind of brokering agent within these sort of tripartite negotiations between uh, labor and capital. Could you elaborate a bit on the role of the state in all this? Yes, the libertarian or, or classical liberal view of the government is it's an umpire. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have any commitment to one side or another, including to one country or another mm -hmm. in libertarianism, which tends to be you know sort of anti-national and globalist. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it just enforces the rules. Whoever wins, wins. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other you could describe as the democratic nationalist, democratic pluralist tradition mm -hmm. sees the democratic nation state uh, as, an, as the coach of a team. And the team includes the national managerial elite and, and investors and workers. And they're competing with other nations. Mm 
So it's inherently somewhat economic nationalist. Uh, it's not it's not necessarily leading to war or anything like that. It's just you know all the different countries are trying to make their own people more prosperous. Uh, and so as a result of that, <clears throat> the government can step in uh, and keep the different groups in society from ripping each other apart. But at the same time, uh, it should not just try to dictate things from above. Uh, so I, that's why I think the coach metaphor is better than the umpire metaphor. So would you say that sort of the, this kind of more thoroughgoing concept of democratic representation in the economy, the culture, the politics, is this, uh, is this just a means to class compromise or is it a kind of normative end in itself? Well, I think it's a means to an end. The, the normative end is national unity. Yes. <clears throat> and that's why even though some of this sounds vaguely Marxist, mm. uh, the premise is not that the working class is going to destroy and replace the managerial class. Every society, including communist societies, mm -hmm. have had managerial elites in the modern world. It's not necessarily something you just have. It's all industrial mm -hmm. societies, too. <clears throat> and you have to have them. You have to have experts. You have mm -hmm. to have uh, managers of big enterprises. And... Uh, and in practice, they will probably pass on their advantages to some degree to their children. Even mm -hmm. you see this even in communist industrial mm -hmm. countries. So, so the goal is to give the working class majority the weapons uh, to enforce a compromise and concessions from the managerial elite. Mm -hmm. If the working class was too strong and it were threatening to cripple the managerial elite, I would be for strengthening the managers. Mm -hmm against an overly powerful working class. But the goal is, is national unity. It's uh, what the uh, Whig economist in the 19th century, who was an advisor to Abraham Lincoln, called the harmony of interests. Mm -hmm. And there's this older Whig Republican Hamiltonian tradition, which uh, rejected the Jeffersonian and Jacksonian idea that there's a battle to the death between capital and labor uh, in favor of the idea that uh, they're partners in a common project. Mm -hmm of national development and national construction. But the government is not simply a passive figure. It, it's actively bringing them together and, and regulating their partnership. You write that under democratic pluralism, legislatures can cede large areas of policymaking to those with higher stakes and expertise. Um, that framing sounds a bit like some defenses of the administrative state, of which you're a kind of partial critic, I think it's fair to say. What role, if any, do you think administrative agencies have in brokering this uh, class truce? Well, there have been two kinds of administrative agencies uh, that were somewhat independent of direct presidential political control in American history since the progressive era. One kind is the very technocratic agency mm. where you get the experts are insulated. They're altruistic. They're wise. They have degrees mm. from Ivy League universities. And uh, whatever they think is good for the public. Uh, I'm very suspicious of this for obvious reasons. Uh, the other alternative, which is associated with a lot of the New Deal agencies mm. that were created. Uh, and we have to remember the New Deal was a farmer labor alliance. Mm. It was an alliance of the working class and of the family farmers who had been excluded mm. uh, in the first stage of industrialization in the United States. So they realized that Congress cannot possibly make detailed regulations for everything in an industrial economy. But at the same time, they did not want to turn over vast discretionary power to a bunch of uh, pointy heads, as George Wallace would say, from the Ivy League universities. Uh, so their compromise was to create uh, sector-specific organizations, the FCC, uh, the uh, Agriculture Department, and, and, and various uh, independent agencies, uh, where uh, whether formally or not, the interest groups were represented uh, and had influence in policy. Now, libertarians hate this because they see it as corruption for the interest groups to influence policy. Uh, a certain kind of technocratic progressive hates it because uh, the people who make policy are not supposed to actually be from that field. This, that's their definition of corruption. To my mind, it makes sense because if you're going to make policy for family farmers, then you should talk to family farmers. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to make policy for taxi drivers, then represent the taxi drivers and consult with them. Uh, and, uh, you know, by, by the same token, 
Yeah, I, I think we have this very unrealistic view of the omnicompetent legislator. So, you know, you're a senator, and today you're going to make policy for farming, and tomorrow you're going to do it for pilots, and, the, you know, the day after that you're going to make it for religious liberty. Uh, realistically, and I've worked in st a state legislature, uh, that doesn't happen. What happens in real legislatures is that one or two members of the legislature are known as experts in a particular field. And uh, uh, and usually they have some connection with that field. And their fellow legislators, often across party lines, defer to their expertise. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I argue is that we should not be afraid to delegate some policymaking authority to administrative agencies on condition that they represent interest groups, particularly working class interest groups, whose uh, views might be ignored otherwise. I guess this gets at a, another question, which is, to what extent is the current working class ferment due to a feeling of powerlessness? And how much is it just due to the people in power making bad decisions? Or put another way, if elites had somehow magically taken much better care of the working class and sort of accommodated their interests, even if the working class didn't really have much substantive representation, do you think the working class would still be in revolt. How much of this is about uh, powerlessness, qua powerlessness, versus just if you're powerless, you're less likely to have your preferred policy outcomes? Well, I, I think you can make that distinction in theory. In practice, yes. you really can't, because uh, unless there are institutions that represent the policy preferences of working class people, mm -hmm. they're going to be ignored, mm -hmm. right? So in theory... Uh, you could have had a majority of members of the Democrats or Republicans or bipartisan consensus, mm -hmm. which uh, did not push elite-friendly globalization mm -hmm. policies, which did not push elite-friendly immigration policies, which did not push elite-friendly environmental policies in France. Uh, but there's a reason why mm -hmm. the elite-friendly policies always prevailed. Yes. Right. There's an absence of actual checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So I simply don't believe in the possibility of a benevolent elite unless uh, members of the working class have something beyond the vote. The vote is important, mm -hmm. but casting a vote every couple of years for one of two candidates or one of a couple of candidates, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when both candidates have been chosen by donors and by elite activists, yeah, how much influence is that on the system? That's why I think the, you have to have free elections, mm -hmm. but they have to be supplemented by policymaking bodies with where you have checks and balances mm -hmm. uh, in addition. You also write uh, that, quote, even in so-called capitalist countries, in part as a result of this uh, lack of checks and balances, uh, that property rights have been, quote, diluted and redefined beyond recognition. Um, could you elaborate a bit on the precise mechanisms by which that's happened and sort of what the implications are for the struggle you're describing? Well, my argument is that I, I don't like the term middle class yeah. for, for the majority of people in yes. the U.S. I, I use the term working class. Uh, and, you know, the other word for that, the classic word is proletarian, which sounds kind of Marxist, but it comes from ancient Rome. It meant a propertyless mm -hmm. work, wage worker mm -hmm. who has to earn a living by working for wages. Uh, and we talk about the homeowning majority, the property-owning majority, and so on. But in practice, unless you have paid off your house, a uh, lo uh, mortgage loan completely, you're renting it from the bank. You're you know, paying interest to the bank. So uh, we have kind of an illusion of a property-owning majority, and the same is true of your car. Mm -hmm. You're renting that right. until it's completely paid off, if it ever is. Uh, uh, and I'm not criticizing the system. It's a successful system. Yeah. But but let's not let it uh, believe that most Americans are therefore uh, property owners or, or mm -hmm. in, a, in a significant sense, or that, that certainly that they are capitalists. Uh, the, the vast majority of Americans... Uh, depend in retirement almost entirely on Social Security. Only the top half of the population has any kind of investments in 401ks or, or five, you know, uh, uh, IRAs. Uh, and even that, if you look at the average 401k or 501k uh, IRA, it's, it's a negligible amount of money. It doesn't last very long. 
So, so we really have a majority of people who uh, could not live for more than a few weeks mm-hmm. uh, without a wage, and without turning to the state to unemployment insurance and so on. Uh, they would be destitute in old age, without social security, uh, and. I, and I think this is, you know, one of one of the reasons why I argue that there's a class division in uh, ideas towards entitlement policy. It, it seems insane, if you think about it, that uh, in both Britain and the United States, after the economy crashed in 2008 in the Great Recession, the priority in Britain was austerity, cutting back mm. government spending in the middle of a global depression. Uh, in the United States. Uh, we had the bipartisan effort uh, uh, to cut the deficit with uh, President Obama offering the Republicans cutting Social Security. You know, that would not have happened in a truly democratic system uh, in which uh, ordinary people had the same clout as uh, very well-to-do people. Right. Well, and implicit here seems to be a critique of uh, a kind of Elizabeth Warren, math staller, kind of left producerism that we're seeing a revival of, right? Insofar as it harkens back to this uh, tradition of, well, all Americans should sort of be self-reliant and own their own property. You seem to be saying that that's kind of a pipe dream. Well, my previous yeah. book, which I co-authored with the economist Robert D. Atkinson, yes. was uh, Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Myth of Small Business. Uh, and we criticize this anachronistic 19th century Jeffersonian small producer. Uh, uh, it's just, it's completely uh, anachronistic. Uh, most Americans, a slight majority of Americans today, work for firms with 500 people or more. I love that statistic. It just shocks people. Uh, because of the myth of mo- right. small businesses create mo- small businesses create most new jobs. Mm-hmm. They also destroy most new jobs because almost all small businesses fail. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- so the only job net job creation is by successful businesses, which if they are successful, become medium sized or large uh, mm-hmm. businesses. They level off at some point. But that being the case. And, and this is 100 years out of date. Mm. It was clear in the early 20th century that mm. you could do three things to respond to the rise of large corporations. Well, four things. One is to break them up into little teeny weeny tiny firms yep. again, mom and pop firms. That's the antitrust agenda. Mm. That was considered anachronistic even in World War I. I mean, that was ancient history. By Even by Woodrow Wilson said this is absurd, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt has this reputation as a trust buster. Uh, but if you actually read what he says, he thought it was inevitable you have these large corporations and they should be regulated. So if you reject breaking them up into little pieces, what are the three options? Well, there's uh, nationalization. That's what the socialists wanted. So Eugene Debs and the socialists thought, Trusts were great, right? Because it's easier to nationalize a big firm than a, a small firm. There's regulation, uh, and then there's uh, countervailing power, mm-hmm. to use the term again, uh, from John Kenneth Galbraith. The labor movement under Samuel Gompers and labor leaders in the early 20th century said, well, we don't want socialism. We are not socialists. We want dynamic firms. We want to share their profits as workers. We don't want our own little tiny mom and pop mm-hmm. firms. We like working for you know, uh, steel companies and car companies, as long as we're paid decently. Uh, We we don't want the government to regulate uh, our wages and benefits because we think that the rich lobbyists will always have more clout in Congress than representatives of working people. So therefore, their option, which I argue for, Mm -hmm. is countervailing power. You uh, pool the labor power of workers, but then you negotiate with with uh, big firms. Now, there's a fifth option, which is, a, is even more absurd than the uh, antitrust option. That's the libertarian one, where you just allow oligopolies and monopolies uh, to grow. Uh, and, and they may grow simply because they're dynamic and efficient. Uh, but if they abuse their power, uh, you know, then you just turn a blind eye to it. Uh, and you have to be an ideological libertarian to believe that a janitor an individual janitor has bargaining power with a company with 500 people. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's just pure nonsense. And it's been recognized as such. Even J.S. Mill, uh, who is cited as a classical liberal thinker, was for unions because he says, of course, there's no way one individual can negotiate a 
contract of employment realistically with a large firm. Right. You say that uh, immigration has made uh, this kind of labor negotiation more difficult by creating a split labor market that ends up hurting low-wage workers. Yet several studies have found that it was cultural anxiety, not economic distress, or at least they claim to find that, uh, that best predicted support for Trump. I guess, would it be fair to say that immigration is primarily a cultural battleground in this new class war, or do you think the materialist story is underrated? Well, that's a, it's a misleading question. And, and most of the social science on Trump and Brexit is worthless because uh, you have political scientists, mm-hmm. they look for a single factor, right? You know, was it deindustrialization? Was it racial views? Mm-hmm. Is it age or whatever? Uh, and since you're dealing with a society that's clatif- stratified by class and divided by race, people have multiple characteristics. And you can't catch that if you're doing a regression analysis with one polling question. So, so you know, I'll just dismiss a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, what I do in the book is I build on a scholar, a sociologist named Enda Bonasech's mm-hmm. idea of a split labor market. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's when you have two populations uh, competing mm-hmm. for the same job. Sometimes they're of different ethnicity. They can be of different region of the country, different class. But they have distinct identifiable characteristics, and employers uh, prefer the one that is willing to work for lower wages, whatever their defining characteristic is. uh, So, for example, in the 19th century, uh, industrial capitalists in the North brought in uh, not just African Americans, but also poor whites from the South uh, to undercut uh, unionization by mostly European immigrants in the, in northern industrial cities, often Irish Americans, uh, German, Polish, Italian Americans. Uh, so that's an example of a split labor market. Uh, uh, employers brought in Chinese indentured servants to California and the West Coast uh, to undercut attempts of unionization by uh, white labor activists. So. Inevitably, when that happens, there's racial resentment as well as economic resentment, right? So the Irish-American labor organizers in San Francisco, you know, will denounce the Chinese for their cultural characteristics. uh, And at the same time, they'll denounce the capitalists for bringing them in to undercut their wages, right? So you you have to think about that in terms of this three-way conflict among employers and two different groups of workers. And it's not simply racist, anti-racist paradigm by any means. Sure, sure. On the other hand, it's not pure pure economics because there's often this ethnic resentment element because these are different groups. Well, and, and I suppose immigration is part of a larger story you tell about global labor arbitrage, right? Can you briefly expand on that? Yeah, arbitrage is making a profit uh, by exploiting the difference mm-hmm. in jurisdictions uh, with respect to uh, the, 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 the value of the same mm-hmm. good, whatever it is, uh, in this case, labor. So it, is not, it has nothing to do with productivity growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is something that is confused and talks about globalization. Uh, if you shut down a factory in the Midwest and open up a new factory employing cheaper labor in South China or in Mexico, using exactly the same technology, the profit of your firm goes up because the wage share of the profit has gone down. Uh, You're no more productive than you were, and you don't produce any more output because productivity is output per worker. The Chinese workers or the Mexican workers are producing cars or whatever at the same, you know, iPhones, the same rate that the American workers were. They just paid much less. Uh, So that's arbitrage, uh, labor arbitrage. Uh, You also get labor arbitrage with immigration. Uh, When employers uh, bring in a group from abroad uh, to work at the same jobs that uh, natives or naturalized immigrants have been working at, just for lower wages, they're not more productive, they're not more skilled, they're not more efficient, they're just cheaper. So switching gears a bit to culture, um, you hold up... uh, the sort of post-World War II uh, consensus as a kind of model of democratic pluralism, um, not just in the field of economics, but also in culture. Um, 
it seems to me that one could plausibly argue that there was a kind of shared Christian moral consensus in the United States at that time that's since broken down and that the working class, as you sort of acknowledge in the book, is diverse, morally, I mean, it's morally, philosophically, politically diverse. So so how do we kind of restore some cultural power sharing agreement when it's not obvious there's a shared culture, even necessarily among the working class? Well, I I disagree with that characterization of the post-war period. Uh, Up until then, you had a mainline Protestant establishment Mm -hmm. in the United States, Mm -hmm. uh, and it was very anti-Catholic and it was Mm -hmm. anti-Jewish. And and so Jewish kids and Catholic kids had to recite, you know, the the Protestant prayers Mm -hmm. in schools and sing Protestant hymns and so on. And and like Americanization was stripping them of being Jewish and Catholic, turning them. And evangelical Protestants suffered as well because these Mm -hmm. were mainline Protestants who didn't like evangelical Protestants, particularly in the South. So I think it was a great achievement after World War II. Uh, the U.S. created what the sociologist Will Herberg uh, called the triple establishment. Uh, he wrote a book called Protestant Catholic Jew. Uh, and I'm old enough to remember growing up at every high school commencement, you had a priest, a minister, and a rabbi. So it was pluralistic. Now, they all shared a general... The, the term Judeo-Christian was invented yeah. around that time to pretend these religions are part of the same thing, which their theologians will dispute. Uh, uh, so I'm not saying we return to that right. and ignore secular people, particularly secularization is increasing right. in the U.S. as in Europe. Mm-hmm. But I think we've moved back toward a secularized Protestant uh, mainline mm-hmm. establishment. Uh, and if if you look at a lot of the wokeness and, yes. and you know, people have argued this is a kind of secularized version of New England Puritanism, right. at least in the U.S. And they go after exactly the same people, right. the old Northeastern mainline Protestants went after, which are Southern evangelicals, mm-hmm. Catholics, and uh, traditional non-liberal Jews and Muslims as well, although they treat Muslim as a racial category uh, to be favored rather than a religious conservative category, although most Muslims are, are religiously conservative. So uh, so I argue that, uh, you know, we don't want a French-type anti-clerical state, which wants to ban all display of religion, uh, uh, be aggressively anti-religious and secular. That's not the American tradition. It's not the Anglo-American tradition. Uh, we also don't want simply to have the elite's religion, which in the old days was mainline Protestantism. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, you call it mainline secularism. I don't know what you call it. You know, just to dominate the media and education. Mm-hmm. So I think we have to go back to some kind of institutionalized representation. And maybe it will be the, the priest, the minister, the rabbi, yeah. And the druid, right? And the atheist. Yes. Uh, but I, I think that's a much healthier approach in a society, whereas the philosopher John Gray has argued you have deep, permanent value pluralism. Mm-hmm. And you have to have what he calls a modus vivendi. It's mm-hmm. uh, an agreement to live and, and let live and coexist. And in the book, you note that there were, there were, there were essentially, uh, religious and cultural bodies that were kind of informally charged with the oversight of education and the media. Um, and you, you had like films well, the, being submitted for approval. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, the Legion of Decency, which was originated as a Catholic organization. Yeah. It got to where Hollywood would just submit the, uh, there's this wonderful movie by the Coen brothers, Hail Caesar, uh, about making a biblical epic in the 1950s. And there's a great scene where they have the uh, Catholic priest, the Protestant minister, uh, the Orthodox uh, Christian um, uh, priest, and the uh, rabbi, and and the poor studio guys trying to make right, sure this doesn't right. offend anybody. <laughs> now, if you're a a free speech zealot and and of the romantic libertarian bent, uh, then essentially the more shocking to public sensibilities, the better. And, you know, I don't want to go back to the old days where they were censoring uh, uh, Catcher in the Rye in the libraries. But on the other hand, come on, if, if, you know, you have a society uh, that is made up of 
you know, it's half Wiccans and half, you know, Nordic Asatru mm. Thor worshippers. Mm. Uh, you know, what is is the goal of your policy and education and so on? Is it to constantly insult mm. and and uh, humiliate the two groups that are the right. biggest groups in your society? Uh, and you know, what about parents? Mm. If you have compulsory public education, then uh, the the views of the parents ought to be respected by the educators, mm. right? You know, again, this is not anti-clerical France, where the public school is a way to deprogram right. Catholic school children and turn them into French Jacobin Republican citizens, right? right? So, uh, so I, I'm I'm very supportive of mandatory uh, viewpoint diversity. Right in in uh, K through 12 in higher education and also in the media because let's face it uh, the mass media are a de facto public utility it's it's how people communicate it's it's what shapes perceptions and to say that it's a purely private thing uh, and if you don't like it go you know found your own radio network or your own TV network or your own social media platform I don't think that's realistic you also note that in the past, Catholics particularly played a role out of proportion to their democratic to their to their demographic kind of numbers when it came to their uh, policing of the culture. Um, what sort of minority group, if any, do you think would fill that role today? Is there a particular religious or cultural subgroup that seems to exert more influence or could kind of help to revive these uh, religious or secular bodies? Well, well, there there is a kind of a revival of Catholic social thought uh, on, on the right wing of the Republican Party with people like uh, Marco Rubio mm. saying good things about unions. And uh, uh, so you see a kind of a flickering there mm. of, of this older uh, Catholic influence, both in, in the working class uh, economic areas, but also in the culture. Uh, you know, Catholics like Protestants are declining as a percentage of the population. Uh, uh, Southern evangelicals historically, because of their uh, the dispensationalist ideology that was very influential, thinking the end of the world is near, uh, did not, for obvious reasons, you know, put a whole lot of uh, effort mm. into uh, thinking about the details of uh, public policy. Uh, so I think uh, uh, we'll see what happens with um, uh, American Muslims. I think that mm. uh, Muslims, second, third, fourth generation. What you saw with uh, Catholic immigrants and Jewish immigrants was as they became less ethnic diasporas, but they were still religious believers, uh, you know, had grown up in the United States. There were, there were, you know, kind of new Jewish American and Catholic American establishments. I think we may see that with uh, both, you know, Sunni and Shia Muslims. Uh, and to the extent that they don't ac accept the idea that we're just going to go along with what the Ivy League schools say is like the woke secular liberal attitude, you know, they, they may play a role. And you also have a very interesting passage where you say that transphobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, th these terms all medicalize politics and kind of treat differing viewpoints as evidence of some sort of psychological disorder. Um, why do you think that that's become one of the go-to methods for invalidating dissent in the United States? Well, it has very deep roots, nearly a century old. Uh, if you go back to the 1920s and 30s, uh, many of the intellectuals in the Western world mm -hmm. were, were just completely entranced with Freudianism and with, with other kinds of modern psychology. Uh, and they thought that this was a science and it explained mm -hmm. human behavior. Uh, and so the whole project of redefining morality in terms of thera psychology and therapy uh, goes back to Freudianism. Mm -hmm. And then you get these increasingly kind of dumbed down versions of it where uh, one moral dispute after another uh, over uh, gay rights, over you know trans rights, over uh, immigration, uh, you know, uh, gets medicalized so that instead of this being a, a dispute based on thousand-year-old religious texts, mm. uh, uh, the people who hold uh, a certain view are simply emotionally disturbed. Mm. 
And the cure for that is therapy, right? And you see this with a diversity training. The premise is that if you don't agree with whatever the accepted positions are, then you need to be reprogrammed, mm -hmm. right? To become a productive, normal person, you need therapy. Uh, and I think this is just very sinister and totalitarian. Uh, obviously, there are emotionally disturbed people who hate homosexuals. Yeah. And there are deranged individuals with, with a completely insane hatred of people of another race. Uh, but, but as I say, a, a you know, tr Orthodox Jewish rabbi who disapproves of homosexuality, but also of abortion and of divorce and adultery, that's the teachings of Judaism. Right? That's not, yeah. rabbi is perfectly normal, well-adjusted person. That's just the theology. If you want to fight the theology, denounce the theology. Uh, and so it's a very dangerous thing. Uh, and when you have the elites in charge of education mm -hmm. in the media, essentially adopting as their working hypothesis that anyone who disagrees with them uh, needs therapy, mm -hmm. right? then this is very, very sinister. It seems like this uh, kind of medicalization of politics has coincided with the rise of uh, outlets like Vox, which at numerous points you single out for criticism, which I must confess were some of my favorite passages in the book. Um, where you, 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 do you think that the sort of fact check explainer journalism um, that we're seeing now with outlets like Vox is a similar uh, genealogy, this kind of unwillingness to acknowledge genuine clashes of values and to treat all politics as a kind of just technocratic game? Yeah, I, I think that's, Vox very much represents what I call technocratic progressivism, okay. the idea that there is one correct answer, uh -huh. and it's also the moral answer. And so if anyone disagrees with the Vox policy, uh, either they're ignorant or they're uh, they're mentally or emotionally disturbed, right? So it's a very patronizing kind of thing. Having said that, the right wing has this version of it, which is that anyone who disagrees with the rights policies is a traitor uh, or an you know instrument of Satan or is morally evil or stupid. So uh, so you find this on both sides. Uh, but but th the medicalization, that tends to be associated with the overclass center left, not the radical left. Yes. The radical left, the Marxists, don't do this, yeah. uh, you know, because they believe in conflict, including yes. class conflict. I think their theory of class and class conflict is wrong, mm -hmm. but they're actually closer to reality right. than the uh, technocratic progressives for whom if everyone were sane and smart, mm -hmm. there would never be any conflicts at all. So you've talked about technocratic uh, progressives. You've also talked about kind of technocratic libertarians. Do you think in principle that what we might call a technocratic populism is possible, one that genuinely responds to populist complaints through sort of more technocratic market-based solutions, or is that just a contradiction in terms? I think it's a contradiction in terms because uh, if you believe, as I do, mm. that the root of populism uh, is a power deficit, it's a lack of power, then it's not a matter of getting the right policies. You actually have to redistribute the power. And redistributing the power to working class people mm -hmm. means they have the power to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And they have the power to support dumb things. Yes. And their representatives have the power to make bad decisions. Uh, so I don't think you can come up with a kinder and gentler version of technocratic progressivism where you just do better polling, where you're just more benevolent uh, and more sensitive uh, uh, to working class people. You actually, you have to talk to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've spent uh, two decades in the NGO world, uh, apart from receptionists, mm -hmm. you know, and janitors, you never encounter working class people. Uh, the idea that you would actually go out there and ask them what their problems are. The politicians do that, right? So there's this very technocratic approach. And, and there's some good things that come out of it. I mean, you know, I, you don't expect working class people to tell you statistically what is the best, you know, health insurance option. You know, I'm not talking about that. Uh, but just basic preferences, right? So the politicians go out and supposedly hear from people in the Howard Johnson's diner, you know, when they're trying to get elected, uh, 
And then meanwhile, the, the policy experts over here in a think tank or in a, you know, in a university, and uh, they're coming up with the plans, which the politicians then sell to the people in Howard Johnson's. Uh, 50 years ago in this country, it, it, it worked differently. Uh, the parties were federations of state and local parties. So, yes, you know, the word could go forth from Washington to, you know, persuade people this is the way to do it. And often that worked because the, the people involved in, in, you know, the local precinct uh, Democratic or Republican machine, they trusted the mm -hmm. county precinct uh, chairman. Right. But you but the people in D.C. and the parties all, all, also heard from the grassroots things came up. Right. Mm -hmm. So the county people would talk to the state people, state right. people would send a message. You know, there's things are going on out here now that the parties are just shells that are bought mm -hmm. by billionaires. Right. They're just free floating labels. Right. You, you don't get that. And uh, uh, and when uh, the unions crumble and they did bad things as well as good things. Right there, you know, all human organizations have trade-offs, uh, but it meant that there was some kind of mechanism for working-class revolts, you know, to get somebody's ear up above. And in the absence of that, you get what I find fascinating: it's polls, mm -hmm. right? So, well, there's a poll that shows yes. the working-class. Mm -hmm. There's a poll. In the old days, you asked the shop steward or the foreman what the working class thought. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a telephone poll. Right. That shows you the extent to which all of these uh, connecting levels of organization have vanished. If the only way you find out what people is thinking is by calling them randomly and asking their opinion. And it's it, what's interesting, too, is, you know, you talk about strong parties as actually being important for democratic pluralism. And I suppose an irony is that some of the changes that have arguably hollowed out the parties were justified on kind of populist grounds that, oh, these parties aren't representative enough. That's why we need more direct voting, more direct representation. Would, would it be fair to say you think that that's kind of backfired and in fact had um, resulted in democratic deficits? Yeah, I think that's right. Now, you know, sure, there were corrupt, smoke-filled room mm -hmm. politicians. There were sleazy uh, union officials who were you know, embezzling from the union and the, the, the fund. Uh, you know, there were uh, sexual uh, harassment among religious figures. These are human institutions. But there was this whole group. In, in ancient Rome, there were the tribunes. And the role of the tribunes was to represent the ordinary people against the senatorial class. Uh, and the moment... It was reduced to one tribune who was also Caesar. That was kind of the end of that system. So you have to have lots of little petty tribunes. And this class of petty tribunes, of petty power brokers, whom the metropolitan liberals never liked, the elite conservatives never liked them, uh, everybody looked down their noses at them, you know, the church ladies and the local union corrupt boss and the uh, possibly corrupt local union official. But they're all gone now. They're all extinct. It's like the dinosaurs. Uh, and then there's just this huge void in between. So uh, so nothing's perfect. But, but I think we do have to rebuild this group of intermediate brokers so that uh, you, you don't simply have a political system that consists of donors, uh, advertising experts, mm -hmm. and policy wonks who live in New York and Washington and maybe San Francisco. Two very popular proposals that have come from those policy wonks in recent years are universal basic income and then more on the left, I'd say, and some on the right, uh, trust busting. Uh, you in the book more or less reject both of these proposals. Why? Well, universal basic income uh, has always been rejected mm -hmm. by pro-labor uh, people and by uh, social democrats on the theory that uh, if the working class has the bargaining power, through collective bargaining and other means uh, to force employers to pay a living wage, then you don't need a universal mm -hmm. basic income. Mm -hmm. If you work 40 hours a week and, and there's dignity to work. Uh, so, so it's profoundly humiliating mm -hmm. to say that a few people 
are the only productive people in society, and they're you know the CEOs of a, f- a few companies. Everyone else is kind of a parasite, but to to keep them going, either out of charity or to bribe them into silence, we'll just pay them off. This this is utterly abhorrent to the idea of the dignity of labor. It's abhorrent to the idea of a democratic republic where you have an aristocracy and it's just like passing out charity to people. Uh, so, so that's the moral and political reason mm-hmm. for rejecting it. The practical reason is, uh, does anyone think that uh, these billionaires who are hiding all of their income and the corporate or personal in the Cayman Islands mm-hmm. and in Panama and in the Jersey mm-hmm. Islands uh, are going to consent to be taxed to give everyone $12,000 a year. I don't believe that for a moment. Uh, you know, right now, you can't even raise taxes on people making $100,000 or $200,000 a year. Hillary Clinton, when she ran in 2016, defined the middle class as anyone making less than uh, $200,000 a year, right? Okay, we're not going to raise taxes on them. So where's this money coming from for the UBI? Uh, and I've already touched on briefly the fact that the trust busting thing yeah. is, is anachronistic. What's particularly absurd is they're trying to argue that inequality has gone up, mm-hmm. not for the real reason, which is that unions have been crushed and that the labor markets in some sectors have been flooded by low-wage immigrants. They won't talk about that. Instead, it's the monopsony power of big corporations, right? Well, okay, let's act on their argument that you can reduce the monopsony power. That, that, uh, 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 in ter- that, that essentially means there's a buyer's market in labor yeah. from these big firms. Okay, so you break Facebook into five giant firms, <laughs> all right? Do we really believe that the janitor is going to have five times the bargaining power with these post-Facebook successor baby Facebooks? That's, that's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. Well, it's also like, you know, five times zero is still zero. That's right. right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but but the, uh, what you see with the Democrats is mm-hmm. uh, they're, they're rapidly being taken over by formerly Republican libertarians and, and moderates. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as the Bush Republicans and as a lot of libertarians, even Koch brothers, are distancing themselves from the Republican Party, are moving away from the GOP because it's becoming more blue collar. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, when a Bush Country Club Republican decides, oh, I hate Donald Trump, I'm going to mm-hmm. switch to the Democrats, they don't necessarily change their views mm-hmm. about taxes uh, or immigration or their dislike of unions, right? So, so the, at this point, I'll give you a, a, an example I use in the book. Uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of congressional districts uh, in uh, the 2016 elections that went for Clinton uh, are among the wealthiest districts in the United States. And Trump got among the poorest districts mm-hmm. in the U.S. So the idea that the Republicans are the country club managerial mm-hmm. capitalist party and the Democrats are the AFL-CIO right. steel workers, that's like 20, 30 years out of date. It's all in flux. So some of the the proposals you do favor, um, more genuine power sharing proposals, such as, you know, stronger union sectoral bargaining, you briefly uh, note co-determination, although you don't really go into it. All of those, in some sense, imply the creation of veto points uh, in that workers can kind of say no and force a compromise. Um, Do you worry at all about that uh, reducing our efficiency in such a way that other countries like China that really lack any sort of democratic constraints on the market because they're not a democracy, uh, th- that then creates kind of an imbalance where they're more able to take advantage of us if we kind of further sacrifice efficiency? Or do you think that uh, the creation of these veto points can be reconciled with international competition? Well, I think if you distinguish the d- democratic industrial yeah. nations from China. Yes. Uh, Germany has had strong unions and uh, co-determination. Mm-hmm. The unions are a bit weaker than they used to be, yeah. but still. Uh, and their car industry is, and, and the mm-hmm. various other manufacturing industries, 
many ways more advanced and successful than that in the United States, where the companies just want to crush unions and go for the cheapest possible labor. Uh, Japan is very paternalistic, but they have good labor relations as part of this kind of welfare capitalist system. So it's if you look at export competitiveness, the uh, anti-labor countries like the U.S. and the U.K. don't do that well compared to the ones that have some kind of harmonization among their workforces and, and their employers in manufacturing. Uh, what dictatorships like China can do is uh, it's mainly through credit. Uh, it, it's not through you know, the, the labor stuff, through mm -hmm. cheap labor. It's mainly they can uh, uh, dump products below cost mm -hmm. uh, on the rest of the world. And, and the classic dumping strategy, whether it's a firm or a nation, is that you deliberately sell below cost long enough to drive your rivals out of business. Uh, and then at that point, you have a monopoly in the market, and then you jack up the prices, right, to recoup your losses, you know, during the dumping phase. Uh, so if you have government-owned enterprises or nominally private enterprises that have an unlimited credit line in practice from the government, or maybe from banks that the government pressures. Uh, there's no way any private enterprise can compete with a state-backed corporation. So there's no alternative if you're going. If you believe in industrial capitalism as I do, I think it's the most dynamic uh, system for increasing wealth and innovation in history. Uh, you have to block entry to your market by state capitalists. Otherwise, they will wipe out. Yeah. Your firms. Yeah. The, why, this should not even be debated. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So to close, um, just a couple last questions. Uh, bigger picture. Uh, Patrick Deneen, the author of Why Liberalism Failed, recently tweeted that the new class war is, quote, the essential book of the decade. Um, do you do you agree with Deneen that liberalism <laughs> failed? And if or, not, or that it's the essential if, book of the decade? Yeah, well, or, yes. Or that, and, if, and if and if you don't agree with him, why do you think it is that a lot of these sort of post liberals have been raving about your book? Well, I, I think there's agreement mm -hmm. among a, a people with great uh, differing views of history that what we call liberalism now, which I would tend to call, you know, libertarianism or neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. That is, that this real move uh, towards hyper individualism in the culture and towards deregulation of the economy. Uh, you know, th that this is a bad thing. It's bad for community. It's bad for the nation state. It's bad in the long run for the capitalist economy because it undermines its uh, its foundations. Uh, where you get the debate is when this started. So, to my mind. The neoliberal era started in the 70s and really got underway after the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, for some of the uh, critics of liberalism like Deneen, mm -hmm. it starts with the Protestant Reformation or with the Enlightenment. So that's an interesting debate to have. Uh, but uh, that's a philosophical debate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that whatever your theory of the case, mm -hmm. you can agree, you know, that, that the neoliberal moment we hope is over and that... Uh, it's time to create a, a new system, which I, for one, hope will incorporate the good things about neoliberalism, you know, uh, uh, emancipation of sexual minorities, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the gains in civil rights mm -hmm. and civil liberties. Uh, so you want the pendulum to swing back, but not necessarily all the way uh, to where it was uh, before neoliberalism. Uh, so you, you just uh, correct the excesses in the next uh, stage of history. Mm -hmm. You don't seem to have much faith in either political party right now. Um, do you think the power sharing you envision can plausibly arise without any help from established politicians, or are things going to just have to get a lot worse before they get better? Well, in the book, I argue that um, ruling elites generally share power only when they're forced to. And they're forced to either by fear of insurrection from below uh, or by uh, fear of competition with other countries. Uh, at, in most cases, uh, it's very difficult for weak, disorganized, working-class people mm -hmm. or, in the old days, peasants to overthrow a regime. Mm -hmm. So the elite doesn't have a whole lot to worry about uh, uh, from below. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the uh, creation of this mid-century class compromise, mm -hmm. <clears throat> as I document in the new class war, uh, it was done largely during World mm -hmm. War II. 
in the U.S. and in Britain and, and in Germany. The left doesn't like to admit this. They want to pretend it was just this spontaneous upwelling from below. But in fact, uh, it was in, in the union membership shot up radically during World War II because the Roosevelt administration ordered uh, a firm's switch to war production to make a deal with unions in the interest of defeating the Axis powers. Uh, so at this point, I'm actually very pessimistic. I, I, I think that absent some kind of sustained international rivalry where uh, a section of the managerial elite comes to understand that it undermines us in uh, international competition mm -hmm. to have constant labor management warfare, constant, you know, religious cultural warfare, uh, so that if they will reform, mm -hmm. it will be a to save themselves, but also to save the country. You know, so the country can succeed. Uh, absent that. Uh, I, th I think you get a, a situation like a lot of South American countries, uh, South you know, Brazil and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Mexico, you know, Central America. Arguably, they suffered from the fact of not uh, taking part in any major wars because they never had any incentive, you know, for anything like the GI Bill. They never had incentive to extend uh, uh, power uh, to the ordinary people. So they're very oligarchical to this mm -hmm. day. Do you think that competition with China could potentially serve this function? It could, but the fa I'm, a, I'm a realist in my foreign policy views. Uh, so I tend to see world politics as a series of either low-level or very intense mm -hmm. competitions among different great powers. Mm -hmm. So if it's China now, it may be a rising India 50 years from now. It may be somebody else 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it just makes sense as a matter of prudence uh, for a nation state that's also great power like the United States to have a kind of permanent low-level mobilization, uh, uh, which we didn't do after the Cold War. I think future historians will be puzzled mm. by the idea that the, the bipartisan establishment had that there would be no more great power conflicts. So we could move much of our manufacturing and R&D to China, our most likely pure competitor. And that's nothing to worry about, right? It lowers consumer prices. Uh, if you think that today's trading partner may be tomorrow's military rival, then uh, it doesn't mean you're not going to engage in trade and immigration, but you know, you're know you going to have some limits on it for national security reasons alone. Uh, and again, for national security reasons, mm -hmm. Uh, you do not want the class conflicts, racial rivalries, religious disputes to spiral out of control. It undermines the strength and, and harmony of your country in a dangerous world. Last question. Um, the, your theory of the case is very much a systemic one. It's a story about structures and institutions and systems and how they've changed and how they've changed for the worst. What concretely, if anything, can individuals do to promote the kind of systemic change you want to see in the United States? Well, I think the first thing they can do is to get off Twitter, to uh, stop following national news obsessively, which is largely something the educated upper middle class, over class, as I call it, does. Uh, working class people are working. They don't have time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but but it, if you're if you're just retweeting angry memes about national politics, that's not politics. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. It's a kind of entertainment or something. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you so start with your neighborhood, mm -hmm. start with your city. It's not going to be enough. I mean, obviously you have to have this top down element too. But real politics is, you know, getting the dangerous intersection fixed. And it's uh, taking part in a group. Uh, if, if the only thing you do is you vote and then you retweet cartoons about the other party, yeah. you're, you're really you're not engaged in politics. Right. So you have to be part of some kind of group mm -hmm. it can be a community group. It can be a religious group, mm -hmm. it can be organization. It can be a party group. I mean, mm -hmm. it can be Democrats, you know, local Democrats, local Republicans. But. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think the the best way to break the tendency towards increasing nationalization of everything mm 
it, it starts with the individual and it starts locally. Uh, you know, when, when I teach, I'm kind of, you know, uh, amused, if not shocked, by the tendency of uh, young people. If there's any problem, then Washington should fix it, right? If, if you need a bike path, you know, in your city, then Congress should allocate money for the bike path. Well, okay, but why don't you try raising money door to door for the bike path? And if that doesn't work, why not go to the city council? And if that doesn't work, there's the state legislature, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so we really are dr- drifting towards this mm-hmm. system where uh, it's assumed that if you elect the right president, then all problems, state, mm-hmm. federal, and local, social and economic, will be solved because this president has the right policies, right? Uh, that just The Democratic uh, primary has just seemed unreal to me for that reason. Because now you are expected, at least if you're a Democrat, I mean, obviously, Trump, you know, uh, uh, is the incumbent. So, but w- with, with the Democratic candidates, each one has his or her own party platform. They're basically one person parties, mm-hmm. right? And they have, they're expected to have a platform for every single thing. Up until recently, the president was just the head of the party mm-hmm. in Congress, and the party had different wings. There's the farmers and labor, and there's, you know, African-Americans. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, uh, uh, consumer groups. Mm-hmm. And the party platform reflected the relative power of those groups. And the president uh, vowed to help carry out the party platform. So I, I think we're moving towards a nationalized uh, plebiscitary presidential system mm-hmm. where it's simply assumed that uh, it's freely elected, but as a kind of elective dictatorship, where this all-powerful Caesarist or Bonapartist presidency will just solve all of our problems, mm-hmm. and we'll have a plan for all of our problems, right? And then uh, if anything goes wrong in the country, it's the president's fault, even though the president didn't have all that much power in reality. Uh, so, so yeah, the, it, real politics mm-hmm. you know, starts locally, and it consists of having groups of people working together on common projects, uh, beginning at home. Awesome. Well, this was really fun. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Yeah. That was Michael Lind talking to our Aram Sabarium about Michael's book just published by Penguin, The New Class War Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. That's it from us this week. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and to check our website, theamericaninterest.com. The show is produced by Demi Rusick with Sean Keeley. Do join us again next time. But for now, this is me, Richard Alder, saying... Thanks for listening.